London After Midnight, The Wolfman, legendary horror films with one common thread, Chain. The Chain legacy is a long and proud story, one that is far from over. Today, we are honored to have the great grandson and grandson of Lon Chaney Sr. and Jr. return to share more about his family's iconic contributions to film and pop culture and what he is doing to ensure the family name remains relevant and adored for generations to come. Please welcome Ron Chaney. somebody else's problem in a few minutes. <laughs> the minute you hold it, you drop it, and there you are. All right, I'm going to get a seat here. All right, lads. All right, we got it, we got it, we got it. It looks like a train's coming. You know, the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's a train. So thank you for being at Midsummer Scream, and thank you for coming to our little show here. Uh, I just want to say that for the next hour, this is going to be a rocket ride through stuff. Um, not so much a Cheney 101 course, because I'm guessing that a few of you are fans of the Cheney Legacy out there. So the presentation today is to really bring it to the now and talk about tomorrow and what Ron is doing to preserve the legacy of his family moving forward. Um, that said, I want to just say, being a producer of a show like this, you get to be very self-indulgent. And so, We've often said in creating Midsummer Scream, the secret sauce is you create presentations and you create a show that you as a fan want to go to. So when I created the Monster Kids panel, did you guys see that last year? No. All right, so in creating the Monster Kids panel, it was great because I got to assemble all of the monster families on stage for the first time in a convention like that to talk about their collective experience of growing up in the shadows of these iconic creatures that, that everybody around the world knows. And in, in cases like Ron, that is, that's like one, that's one generation and he knew his grandfather, whereas Lynn Lugosi, she didn't know Bela. So what was interesting with, with that was Lynn said, I, I, I'm different because I don't know, I, I didn't know my grandfather, I, I didn't know. And I said, no, but everybody in the world knows your grandfather. And what's weird is you could go any corner of the globe and you will see people wearing your grandfather. And it dawned on me as we were putting that to come. And in some cases, Ron's, Ron's very fortunate because Ron's got a family that is like his small army that's, that's working with him to, to, to move this all forward. Other folks aren't doing it, like Sarah, Sarah Karloff, she's in her 80s and she pretty much does it herself. And so the question has come up over dinner and drinks, more drinks, uh, you know, what, what do you do when, you know, the grandkids or kids pass away and there is nobody to succeed and to push this on? And, and to keep that cemented in, in pop culture and, and film psyche, that's a lot of work, and so we're going to get into that a little bit today. We got some really exciting projects to talk about, but going back to the indulgent part. So growing up, I was a Wolfman kid, man. That, that was my jam. It's like every other Halloween, it was a Wolfman character, right? And so when I got to know Ron, it's just it's very surreal because you're driving home after having dinner or whatever, and drinks and more drinks, and. Uh, you're just like, Jesus Christ, I've just been hanging out with the Wolfman's grandson. How cool is that? Yeah, it's a Wolfman! <laughs> so very, very excited. And it's, it, it's not lost on me how cool this is and, and, and how blessed I am to be in a position to get to know these folks and to get their message out to other fans that, that love their work just as much as I do. I'm not unique. Their grandparents were unique and they left a mark that's indelible and we all are in love with it. That's why we're here this weekend, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. So, anyway, so we are going to go on a little rocket ride. Are we ready? By the way, this is Ron Chaney. Ladies yeah. Ladies. Yeah. Oh, 
All right, so we're going to do just the quick hop, skip, jump version of who these folks were. And I'm going to let Ron, he knows a little bit more about the subject than I do. So I'm going to let him talk while I sit here and try to stop sweating. <laughs> well, I'm seeing the panel here. So this is my great grandfather, Lon Chaney, a man of a thousand faces. Uh, a couple different photos of him there, uh, studio shots. Uh, but you see him here, he looks like somewhat of a normal guy. <laughs> but as we go forward, uh, and the, the one of, on the bottom, and this is him in his uh, makeup room. This was on Blind Bargain. And you can see his makeup uh, case here that he's working out of. And I believe those teeth were from Treasure Island, a film he was in. And that wig there was from Blind Bargain, as you see in this shot. And uh, you know that that uh, makeup case is in the Natural History Museum, and uh, obviously he, I don't know if you all know the background, but his parents were both deaf mutes, and uh, he learned so much expression and pantomime from his parents. It was just a natural way of life for him. So when he he really was on stage, really for the first eleven years of his life, and then he went into the film. So you can see he took all of this experience with him forward and the challenge, he loved makeup, thought he was going to be a comedian, and ended up finding his niche in the drama world. But you can see he looks different. That normal man you see in the beginning, you will now just see change. Yeah. It's pretty amazing when you see, well, anybody, and they, they have the ability to really, it doesn't even look like the same person, right? Sometimes you see people and they're like, yeah, that's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, that's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, and that's Nicholson in makeup, you know? But this looks like three different actors. It really does, and the way that great grandpa had the ability to morph. I mean, I, I he was literally the closest you're going to get to a real life shape shape shifter, right? Indeed. Were two of his most famous yeah. roles. Uh, yeah. Hunchback of Notre Dame, which he did in 1923. Uh, studios left it completely up to him to create the makeup for both the Phantom and the Hunchback. And I had several memos from the studio going, we, we, we can't do this film without Lon Chaney. So it was totally left up to him to create the character. And he would take uh, the novel, these were both novels, and uh, interpret the character and try to recreate what he felt the uh, author was trying to express to an audience at the time. Because these go back into the 1800s, I believe, Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's amazing. That's amazing. It's wonderful. You can sit and look at these all day, but we can't. So uh, what I will, I, I gotta remind you guys, if we if we blow by something, you're like, oh, I really wanted to learn more about that, go see Ron on the show floor. He, he's there for the rest of the afternoon, and he's more than happy to talk to you guys about, about these things. Of course, now my grandfather. Of course, uh, the one, the young picture of him is when he first entered and signed with uh, RKO. And you see that he signed his name Creighton, which was his real name. And he performed under that name for the first three years. And the studios kind of forced him to change it because his father died so unexpectedly. He still had a huge following, even though it was still cha transitioning from silent to talking film. So. This is one of his original studio portraits for RKO. And then, of course, the, the, on the opposite side, it was uh, when he first signed with Universal in his portrait there. And, of course, you can tell that's right preceding the Wolfman. And then, of course, he became a character actor late, later. But shots of this, he did a lot of Westerns. Uh, I have an affinity for Westerns. I really enjoy them. Of course, he played all of, he's the only actor to play all the characters. He did Son of Dracula, which is the one shot. Here he is with Bela Gose and uh, with the cane from the Wolfman. And, you know, he played the mummy. He played Frankenstein. If you come by my booth, we just had an artist do a rendition of the Frankenstein monster, Chaney, which you see here. It's outstanding. And, of course, the mummy and, again, the Wolfman. Yeah. Amazing stuff. And I love this. Again, indulgent, I put the deck together, so I'm gonna put the pictures I want in the deck. <laughs> I send them a lot. Too, yes, you know? did. I go, wow, you didn't get it. I send you a lot, but we, we knew we had a time limitation. Yeah. But here he is with Jack, the great Jack Pierce. Love that. And uh, he, he did the original Boris Karloff and all those early classic uh, monsters at Universal. And uh, people say they had a, you know, kind of a 
rivalry or but that's not true you know it, I've done the Wolfman makeup before and the way that Jack did it, it was all application with glue and I mean he would be really heavy and then he'd have to take it off and he did it daily so his skin was rubbed raw and uh, I think that was just a spoof shot when he's going like this and it's, it's like stop doing that and he burned him at the end he actually singed all the outer hair as you can see in these shots how it's all bristly at the end that was all being singed after it's applied it was all yak hair. That's fantastic. I, th I love I love the, the vertical picture, right, where he's standing, you see the full body shot. It was probably some sort of screen test, right? It was probably some sort of test to see what it looked like. Uh, publicity photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The feet. I mean, it, it just, just, God, we could go on forever. Just yeah. about and he, he was 6'3", anyway, so with this on and in the Frankenstein with the boots, he was like 6'7", so pretty imposing. That is, it's amazing. So the good news is... If you want to learn a lot more about this pretty soon, you're going to get to. Ron, what are we looking at? Okay, so my grandfather uh, wasn't as busy at the end of his life, so he started, instead of acting, he was doing more small bits, but he started working on his own projects, and one of them was called A Century of Cheney. So this, this is some of his original artwork that he was preparing for a book that covered uh, A Century of Cheney's being... My, my great grandmother's often forgotten. She was a singer and on stage for about 10 years as well with Lon Sr. And uh, it was collectively their 100 years of entertainment, uh, Cleva, uh, Lon, and Lon Jr. So that's where that Century of Cheney's name came from. So here he is when he was on stage, the Columbia Opera Company. This is one of his early shots. You can see what he looked like young. And the one to, these are chapters of the book that I'm working on. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't finish it, so I'm trying to finish it for him. And I love the graphics of the era. So I use as often as I can to really take you back to that period of time. And so I use the graphics and I integrate them with photos and try to make it a fun book. Because my grandfather really wanted you to be able to open the book anywhere. You didn't have to start from the beginning, flip through, but hope you find something entertaining wherever you want to start the beginning the end the middle doesn't matter so these are like chapter heads uh, so the really important films I would like Hunchback and The Phantom uh, they get their own chapter where some of them just kind of go through the career so you see the diversity and how many did because it was pretty phenomenal uh, but you can see some of the makeup here he did all his own designs uh, and this is the Red Death and the Phantom. But again, I use the graphics of that era because yep. you don't see things like this anymore. I, I just fell in love with it, so I'm using as much as possible in the and book. Ron's not the only one that fell in love with it. One, one of the times that Elianova and I were at his house, he showed us the galley of, of this book. And it is just, it, it, your mind will melt because every page is like this. The, the love and the care that is going into crafting this book is unbelievable and it's going to be a, a must-have for every fan and it's going to be a, a, a true showpiece i mean how many pages are we talking well that's the tough part <laughs> i'm about 350 and i probably left so much in now so i'm going to try to figure out how to cut it back for you younger folks that's a lot of tweets and uh, <laughs> and that's only it's turned into because it was supposed to be collectively about uh cleva senior and junior but there was so much material and I uncovered a lot of Lon Senior's stage crew, which very little is known about. And so it got so voluminous, I really decided to do a volume one and a volume two. So volume one ends with uh, Lon's passing and then volume two will pick up. Uh, it, it ends fade, fade out on Lon Senior and then fade in on Junior. So then I take his career forward through his life. Who's excited about that? Yeah! Beautiful, and, and like I said, every page is just gripping with, it's just visually pretty to look at. It's really, really cool to look at the whole thing. And of course, the, the words and, and, and the texts in there, everything is just so invaluable to documenting this family's legacy and the careers of these two gentlemen. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Everything is kind of like meshed together, and I can't wait, I can't wait for fans to have it. The, of course, he only did one talking film. Uh, he died very unexpectedly in 1930. He had just completed a remake of a silent version of Unholy Three, and so this is they were touting him to talk. And a lot of the silent film actors at that time, they really couldn't speak in front of a camera. But he had had 10 years on stage plus, 
So for him, the transition wasn't about that. It was more about, you're going to pay me at this point in my life? <laughs> so he held out and he got a bonus to do the well, film. There you go. And then, of course, Fade Out was the uh, last chapter when he passes away. Well, here's some talk family. about the century of Janie, right? <laughs> Here, here's well, some here. faces. <laughs> so these are, okay, let me go back to the, the bottom, well, my right, probably your left. That's Lon Sr. and my grandfather known as Creighton at that time, and his second wife, Hazel. They were in Colorado Springs after he needed to recuperate after a hunchback in Notre Dame, because they did a lot of damage to his body. He had to wear glasses after that, because he kept the you know prosthetics on too long. And uh, you can see he's doing sign language, so he's very fluent. He used it in a lot of his films. If, if, if anybody knows sign, you, you will spot it in his film, like abbreviated versions of it. So he's signaling down something, out, or probably something like the mule or something. I thought he was throwing one of these. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> and then uh, the, the one up on top were my grandfather. That's my brother and sister, Gary and Karen. And then my two cousins on the other side. And I'm sitting on my grandfather's lap. I'm the little guy there. <laughs> so that then, brings, I love that picture because it brings it into focus. Just how close the generation step is there. That's, that's pretty awesome. I love that picture so much. And then uh, the other one is me, my wife Linda, and my three children, uh, Creighton, Jennifer, and Jacqueline. And uh, they're wonderful. They, maybe some of you saw Jennifer was here, and Creighton helped me yesterday, Jennifer Friday. And uh, they help with me in the Cheney Entertainment. And then the baby up there is my first granddaughter. And that's how I do it. All right, so there is another project that Ron's been working on, and it's called A Thousand Faces. Ron, why don't you tell the people in the audience what that's all about? Okay, well, I rewrote uh, London After Midnight because I wanted to remake the film since it's a lost film so people can see what it actually looked like, and I it used the original script, and then I re uh, used the novel and wrote bridging scenes. And so I was in New York doing this, and I got a call out of left field going, Hey, I'm a, a director, uh, he works for uh, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, he's an assistant director on that, and he goes, you know, I was a big James Cagney fan, and I watched Man of a Thousand Faces when I was young, and it made such an impression on me, but I always had this thing in me because he was into music and uh, stage, and he went to Colorado Springs, he went to the uh, theater there, and he said, I think there's a play here. So he called me up, and I happened to be in New York, and he lives in New York, and so he called me up and said, hey, would you be interested in doing a stage play? And at that point, I was really heavy into uh, the stage career of Lon and Cleva that nobody knows much about. He goes, but it's a musical. And I go, wow, a musical, huh, okay, well, I, I was thinking maybe a dramatic, but you know what, now that I know so much about their stage career, they do mostly musical comedies, light operas, so it really made sense. And, and from a stage perspective, as far as sets go, you know, the early motion pictures were all done on these sets that were very uh, conducive to a stage setting. So I said, a musical, okay, well, let's do it. So I flew back to New York and I started giving them the story. And this is what we ended up, we actually premiered it in Michigan just to kind of do a test audience. And we're looking hopefully for another theater to pick us up. And these are some stills from, from it, uh, from our premiere. Uh, Danny Gardner played Lon, and he was just simply amazing. He was willing to put go into the penalty uh, piece. Uh, the one on the bottom is it starts off with his early life with his parents, so you get the deaf background. And then the one with the making faces with each other is a young Creighton with his dad on on set. And then it jumps in Act Two to later in their life, and that's a, a older Lon. And, and his son now, Craig, now was now on stage. So these are some of the shots from our. From I, our I, I want to see this. So if people are excited about musicals, about the the, the writing the the independence, like the Hamilton, it was a big word, Hamilton. Uh, who would want to see that, right? Yeah. And to keep that cemented in in pop culture and and film psyche. That's a lot of work, and so we're going to get into that a little bit today. We got some really exciting projects to talk about, but going back to the indulgent part. So growing up, I was a Wolfman kid, man. That, that was my jam. It's like every other Halloween, it was a Wolfman character, right? 
And so when I got to know Ron, it's just, it's very surreal because you're driving home after having dinner or whatever, and drinks and more drinks, and uh, you're just like, Jesus Christ, I've just been hanging out with the Wolfman's grandson. How cool is that? Yeah, it's a Wolfman! <laughs> so very, very excited. And it's, it, it's not lost on me how cool this is and, and, and how blessed I am to be in a position to get to know these folks and to get their message out to other fans that, that love their work just as much as I do. I'm not unique. Their grandparents were unique and they left a mark that's indelible and we all are in love with it. That's why we're here this weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. So anyway, so we are going to go on a little rocket ride. Are we ready? By the way, this is Ron Chaney. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to do just the quick hop, skip, jump version of who these folks were. And I'm going to let Ron, he knows a little bit more about the subject than I do. So I'm going to let him talk while I sit here and try to stop sweating. <laughs> well, I'm seeing the panel here. So this is my great-grandfather, Lon Chaney, a man of a thousand faces. Uh, a couple different photos of him there, uh, studio shots. Uh, but you see him here, he looks like somewhat of a normal guy, <laughs> but as we go forward, uh, and the, the one of, on the bottom, and this is him in his uh, makeup room, this was on Blind Bargain, and you can see his makeup uh, case here that he's working out of, and I believe those teeth were from Treasure Island, a film he was in, and that wig there was from Blind Bargain, as you see in this shot, and uh, you know, that, that uh, makeup case is in the Natural History Museum, and uh, Obviously he, I don't know if you all know the background, but his parents were both deaf-mutes and uh, he learned so much expression and pantomime from his parents. It was just a natural way of life for him. So when he, he really was on stage really for the first 11 years of his life. And then he went into the film. So you can see he took all of this experience with him forward and the challenge he loved makeup thought he was going to be a comedian and ended up finding his niche in the drama world. But you can see he looks different. That normal man you see in the beginning, you will now just see change. Yeah. It's pretty amazing when you see, well, anybody, and they, they have the ability to really, it doesn't even look like the same person, right? Sometimes you see people and they're like, yeah, that's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, that's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, and that's Nicholson in makeup, you know? <laughs> but this looks like three different actors. It, it really does. And the way that Great grandpa had the ability to morph. I mean, I, I, he was literally the closest you're going to get to a real life shape shapeshifter, right? Indeed. Were two of his most famous yeah. roles. Uh, yeah. Hunchback of Notre Dame, which he did in 1923. Uh, studios left it completely up to him to create the makeup for both the Phantom and the Hunchback. And I had several memos from the studio going, we, we, we can't do this film without Lon Chaney. So it was totally left up to him to create the character. And he would take uh, the novel, these were both novels, and uh, interpret the character and try to recreate what he felt the uh, author was trying to express to an audience at the time. Because these go back into the 1800s, I believe, Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's amazing. That's amazing. It's wonderful. You can sit and look at these all day, but we can't. So uh, what I will, I, I gotta remind you guys, if we, if we blow by something, you're like, oh, I really wanted to learn more about that, go see Ron on the show floor. He, he's there for the rest of the afternoon, and he's more than happy to talk to you guys about, about these things. Of course, now my grandfather. Of course, uh, the one, the young picture of him is when he first entered and signed with uh, RKO. And you see that he signed his name Creighton, which was his real name. And he performed under that name for the first three years. And the studios kind of forced him to change it because his father died so unexpectedly. He still had a huge following, even though it was still cha transitioning from silent to talking film. So. This is one of his original studio portraits for RKO. And then of course, the, the, on the opposite side, it was uh, when he first signed with Universal in his portrait there. And of course, you can tell, that's right, preceding the Wolfman. And then of course, he became a character actor late, later. But shots of this, he did a lot of Westerns. Uh, I have an affinity for Westerns. 
I really enjoy them. Of course, he played all of, he's the only actor to play all the characters. He did Son of Dracula, which is the one shot. Here he is with Bela Gosi and uh, with the cane from the Wolfman. And, you know, he played the mummy, he played Frankenstein. If you come by my booth, we just had an artist do a rendition of the Frankenstein monster, Cheney, which you see here is outstanding. And of course, the mummy, and again, the Wolfman. Yeah. Amazing stuff. And I love this. Again, indulgent, I put the deck together, so I'm going to put the pictures I want in the deck. <laughs> I send them a lot. Too, yes, you know? did. I go, wow, you didn't get it. I send you a lot, but we, we knew we had a time limitation. Yeah. But here he is with Jack, the great Jack Pierce. Love that. And uh, he, he did the original Boris Karloff and all those early classic uh, monsters at Universal. And uh, people say they had a, you know, kind of a rivalry, or but that's not true. You know, it, I've done the Wolfman makeup before, and the way that Jack did it, it was all application with glue, and I mean, he would be really heavy, and then he'd have to take it off, and he did it daily, so his skin was rubbed raw, and uh, I think that was just a spoof show, and he's going like this, and it's, it's like, stop doing that. And he burned him at the end, he actually singed all the outer hair, as you can see in these shots, how it's all bristly at the end, that was all being singed after it's applied, and it was all yak hair. That's fantastic. I, th I love I love the the vertical picture right where he's standing. You see the full body shot. There's probably some sort of screen test, right? There's probably some sort of test to see what it looked like. Uh, publicity photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The feet. I mean, that, that just is. God, we could go on forever. Just yeah. couple And he, he was six three anyway. So with this on and in the Frankenstein with the boots, he was like six seven. So pretty imposing. That is. It's amazing. So the good news is. If you want to learn a lot more about this pretty soon, you're going to get to. Ron, what are we looking at? Okay, so my grandfather uh, wasn't as busy at the end of his life, so he started, instead of acting, he was doing more small bits, but he started working on his own projects, and one of them was called A Century of Cheney. So this, this is some of his original artwork that he was preparing for a book that covered uh, A Century of Cheney's being... My, my great grandmother's often forgotten. She was a singer and on stage for about 10 years as well with Lon Sr. And uh, it was collectively their 100 years of entertainment, uh, Cleva, uh, Lon, and Lon Jr. So that's where that Century of Cheney's name came from. So here he is when he was on stage, the Columbia Opera Company. This is one of his early shots. You can see what he looked like young. And the one to, these are chapters of the book that I'm working on. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't finish it, so I'm trying to finish it for him. And I love the graphics of the era. So I use as often as I can to really take you back to that period of time. And so I use the graphics and I integrate them with photos and try to make it a fun book. Because my grandfather really wanted you to be able to open the book anywhere. You didn't have to start from the beginning, flip through. but. Hope you find something entertaining wherever you want to start the beginning the end the middle doesn't matter so these are like chapter heads uh so the really important films i would like hunchback and the phantom uh they get their own chapter where some of them just kind of go through the career so you see the diversity and how many did because it was pretty phenomenal uh, but you can see some of the makeup here he did all his own designs uh, and this is the Red Death and the Phantom. But again, I use the graphics of that era because yep. you don't see things like this anymore. I, I just fell in love with it, so I'm using as much as possible in the and book. Ron's not the only one that fell in love with it. One, one of the times that Elianova and I were at his house, he showed us the galley of, of this book. And it is just, it, it, your mind will melt because every page is like this. The, the love and the care that is going into crafting this book is unbelievable and it's going to be a, a must-have for every fan and it's going to be a, a, a true showpiece i mean how many pages are we talking well that's the tough part <laughs> i'm about 350 and i probably left so much in now so i'm going to try to figure out how to cut it back for you younger folks that's a lot of tweets and uh, <laughs> and that's only it's turned into because it was supposed to be collectively about uh cleva senior and junior but there was so much material and i uncovered a lot of lawn senior's stage crew which very little is known about and so it got so voluminous i really decided to do a volume one and a volume two so volume one ends with uh, lawn's passing and then volume two will pick up uh it, it ends fade fade out on lawn senior and then fade in on junior so then i take his career forward through his life who's excited about that yeah It's 
beautiful. And, and like I said, every page is just gripping with, it's just visually pretty to look at. It's really, really cool to look at the whole thing. And of course, the, the words and, and, and the texts in there, everything is just so invaluable to documenting this family's legacy and the careers of these two gentlemen. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Everything is kind of like meshed together and I can't wait, I can't wait for fans to have it. The, of course, he only did one talking film. Uh, he died very unexpectedly in 1930. He just completed a remake of a silent version of Unholy Three, and so this is they were touting him to talk. And a lot of the silent film actors at that time, they really couldn't speak in front of a camera. But he had had 10 years on stage plus, so for him the transition wasn't about that. It was more about you're going to pay me at this point in my life. <laughs> so he held out and he got a bonus to do the well, film. There you go. And then, of course, Fade Out was the uh, last chapter when he passes away. Well, here's some talk family. about a century of Janie, right? <laughs> Here, here's well, some here. faces. <laughs> so oh. these are, okay, let me go back to the, the bottom, well, my right, probably your left. That's Lon Sr. and my grandfather known as Creighton at that time, and his second wife, Hazel. They were in Colorado Springs after he needed to recuperate after a hunchback in Notre Dame, because they did a lot of damage to his body. He had to wear glasses after that, because he kept the you know prosthetics on too long. And uh, you can see he's doing sign language, so he's very fluent. He used it in a lot of his films. If, if, if anybody knows sign, you, you will spot it in his film, like abbreviated versions of it. So he's signaling down something, out, or probably something like the mule or something. I thought he was throwing one of these. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> and then uh, the, the one up on top were my grandfather. That's my brother and sister, Gary and Karen. And then my two cousins on the other side. And I'm sitting on my grandfather's lap. I'm the little guy there. <laughs> so that then, brings, I love that picture because it brings it into focus. Just how close the generation step is there. That's, that's pretty awesome. I love that picture so much. And then uh, the other one is me, my wife Linda, and my three children, uh, Creighton, Jennifer, and Jacqueline. And uh, they're wonderful. They, maybe some of you saw Jennifer was here, and Creighton helped me yesterday, Jennifer Friday. And uh, they help with me in the Cheney Entertainment. And then the baby up there is my first granddaughter. That's how I remember. All right, so there is another project that Ron's been working on, and it's called A Thousand Faces. Ron, why don't you tell the people in the audience what that's all about? Okay, well, I rewrote uh, London After Midnight because I wanted to remake the film since it's a lost film so people can see what it actually looked like, and I it used the original script, and then I re uh, used the novel and wrote bridging scenes. And so I was in New York doing this, and I got a call out of left field going, Hey, I'm a, a director. Uh, he works for uh, Beauty, Beauty and the Beast. He's an assistant director on that. And he goes, you know, I was a big James Cagney fan. And I watched Man of a Thousand Faces when I was young. It made such an impression on me, but I always had this thing in me because he was into music and uh, stage. And he went to Colorado Springs and went to the uh, theater there. And he said, I think there's a play here. So he called me up. And I happened to be in New York, and he lives in New York. And so he called me up and said, hey, would you be interested in doing a stage play? And at that point, I was really heavy into uh, the stage career of Lon and Cleva that nobody knows much about. He goes, but it's a musical. And I go, wow, a musical, huh, okay, well, I, I was thinking maybe a dramatic, but you know what, now that I know so much about their stage career, they do mostly musical comedies, light operas, so it really made sense. And, and from a stage perspective, as far as sets go, you know, the early motion pictures were all done on these sets that were very uh, conducive to a stage setting. So I said, a musical, okay, well, let's do it. So I flew back to New York and I started giving them the story. And this is what we ended up, we actually premiered it in Michigan just to kind of do a test audience. And we're looking hopefully for another theater to pick us up. And these are some stills from, from it, uh, from our premiere. Uh, Danny Gardner played Lon, and he was just simply amazing. He was willing to put go into the penalty uh, piece. Uh, the one on the bottom is it starts off with his early life with his parents, so you get the deaf background, and then the one with the making faces with each other is a young Creighton with his dad on on set, 
and then it jumps in Act 2 to later in their life, and that's an older lawn, and, and his son, now Craig, now is now on stage. So these are some of the shots from our... From I, our love, I, I want to see this. So if people are excited about musicals, about the, the, the writing the, the independence, like the Hamilton, it was a big word, Hamilton, uh, who would want to see that, right? Yeah. Like, wow. So uh, we have the, uh, I think we put a little trailer together. We do. You guys want to see it? See a little bit of that? All right, movie time. Let's go ahead and play that. And it is a tough road to get a, a play up on stage, especially with musical, because there's so much more to that. So we were fortunate to partner with a, a Encore Theater in Michigan, so we at least got to kind of stage it, see what it looks like, and work out some of the kinks. And people really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, it got shut down a week because of COVID, but we had enough people come see it that, you know, we're looking to partner with another theater somewhere, hopefully. You guys know anybody? It's going to happen, right? You know it's going to happen. We're going to manifest that's going to happen. So that brings us to today, now, right? And so what, what is Cheney Entertainment? Well, I formed Cheney Entertainment uh, to preserve and perpetuate the family history and legacy. And, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing as a contractor prior to that. So uh, it's been a, a learning experience. I formed it in 1992. And... Uh, I license products. I think if you come to our table, you'll see just some of them. And uh, really, I, it was Cheney Enterprises when I first, because I'm, I'm all over the map. Uh, but, you know, I thought, I want to really do entertainment. That's what I want to do, you know. I, I know my family did that, but I have my own aspirations, so sometimes you got to put yourself in order. I know who they were, so, you know, I'll always follow in behind. But I thought, you know, I've got my own artistic flair and creativity, so this is a part of it. And I started off, actually, I petitioned postage stamps uh, in 1993, and the first stamp that came out was uh, part of the Silent Screen series, or Silent Screen Stars, and they premiered in 1994, they were released, and that's the Lon Chaney 29 cent stamp, well, of course not that anymore. <laughs> And then, uh, so that had come out, but I had petitioned for both uh, Lon Sr. and Jr. And I asked for no caricature. Of course, this is a Hirschfeld, so how could I say no? And it was along with Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton. There was 10 different stamps that represent the silent screen era. And then when I met uh, Bela Lugosi Jr. and Sarah Karloff, who some of you saw, uh, well, Bela wasn't here last year, but uh, we all met back at a show in Virginia. And... Uh, I said, well, you know, I've been through this uh, thing we've once before. Uh, my attorney's written everything up. We just had changed names. I, I think it would be awesome if we all merged together and got all of our families up there. So we started uh, putting petitions out, and we had tens of thousands of people sign these to where the post office said, please, stop sending us all of this. Enough's enough. We're going to go vote on it soon. 
And so there was a little conflict of monsters, and I said, listen, you have to put their faces on, because they only want to do the characters. And it was our request by the families to make sure you know who the man is under the makeup. And then, of course, the classic movie Monster Stand came out, and it was a huge success for the post office, and led to me signing an agreement with Universal for licensing, so that was an amazing campaign. I guess so moving forward, uh, we're moving. I, uh, like I said earlier, I, I really like westerns. I like horses. Uh, you saw the earlier picture of me with my horse, Magnum. But uh, this was an early test on a, a screenplay I developed called Phantom Rider. And uh, these were some test makeups, uh, or at least the one in the center, and that's just me with contacts in. And uh, Ed French was a makeup artist on that. And uh, the, the one there was just some artwork we did to try to help push it. And then, <laughs> recently... Yeah, uh, what, what's <laughs> this, Ron? <laughs> well, I did another one. I, when Phantom Rider didn't go, you know, I was kind of like, ah, shit, what am I going to do next, you know? Uh, and I remember picking up the Wolfman cane that I had done with uh, Alvarez Wax, and uh, it just came to me in a flash. It goes, Wolfman, that's it. And so I started developing this story called Curse of the Wolfman. It was meant to kind of, not with all the different sequels, but it was meant to be like a, a sequel to the original Wolfman. And, uh, you know, we did a short, which we could have shown them, but we didn't, years and years ago. And then I did another one, London After Midnight, kind of hit me like, nobody really knows what it looks like, what is, what's going on, so I started writing that screenplay. And then I met somebody at the play, the publisher, and they said, you're kidding me. You're chaining and you wrote these things? I said, yeah, I kind of been playing around with it. You want to read them? And they said, yes. So we're tur they're turning them into graphic novels, and this is a promo for that. <laughs> so this one, this is some of uh, the artist's rendition so far. Uh, we hope to release London After Midnight, uh, hopefully in October, at least a smaller version, but hopefully this year. And then Curse of the Wolfman will follow. And I also have a Phantom Rider I may do with them. And then I have three scripts that my grandfather wrote that not very many people know about. So I said, I've got enough material here for probably about the next six years if you want to do one a year. And uh, this is part of the artwork from it. Fantastic. Nice. And then, of course, I like to play around with makeup. So uh, Casey Wong did the, the London After Midnight. And... I did a Halloween event, uh, you know, that's why this show is really kind of cool, because I love haunted houses and scaring people, so, uh, you know, I just, I like doing makeup, and I did one film with my friend Evan called House of the Wolfman, so that one is, is down below, the black and white, and then I was at another show, we just did a real fun phantom makeup, just to be in front of the people in makeup, and then the mummy, I had a, a mummy suit from my, uh, haunted house, so that's the other one. <laughs> Ron really does love this stuff, and we've actually talked about Ron doing something in the Hall of Shadows. Would you guys like that? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk. We're going to talk this coming year. Make something happen. Okay, so what, what are we looking at here? All right. Well, my friend, David Woodruff, we were talking about, uh, yeah. we did a Wolfman a series of shots. It was so much fun. I love how he worked and him as a person. And I was telling him about some of these other scripts that I had done, but really never kind of went anywhere. So I hold out hope that they will happen. He, he told me, hey, I did a little Western. I go, Western? Yeah, really? Yeah. So he said, you want to, I said, how much? <laughs> so I said, let's do it. Like, can we pull this off? pretty quick and sure enough here we do and I was just playing around with some artwork just to create something for it so uh, this is what that is so David at this time why don't you and Matt actually both come on up stage here we go we got some folks associated with the yeah. Yeah. yeah or you can just be on the rock star and come up he doesn't need any oh, no. stairs. <laughs> that would have blown out my groin, and I would have been like this. He's got the water seat. So, yeah. So my said, my problem. going to be someone else's problem. Yeah, that's the <laughs> problem. No, no problem, buddy. So this well, is David. We've become good friends, and we hope to produce a whole bunch more. And we just hit it off with the entire cast and crew, and I know a lot of them are in here today. 
and Matt was in the film, and we hit yeah. it all off. And uh, you. You know, when I was reading the script, I was looking at it going, I think there's a song here. So I started writing a song, and then come to find out, I met Matt, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I'm a vocalist. So I'm like, really? You want to take a shot at this? And I had just printed it out, so I handed it to him, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. So, actually, David, why don't you talk about, like, meeting Ron and getting to meet Ron, and then we'll get into more of, of Devil's Den stuff. Nothing bad. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, it just kind of happened, you know? Um, I started doing, I started as a makeup artist, and a makeup effects artist, and I guess during COVID, I was looking for something to do, and, and uh, was working. We all were, right? <laughs> I was looking at, I was working at a company called RBFX, and wound up doing some Frankenstein pieces for their prosthetic catalog, and got copies, you know, uh, for something to do with, to play with, and that became an anniversary shoot for Frankenstein, which quickly blew out of proportion. Matt knows. Matt, Matt's our Karloff. Um, we're, we have a mummy coming up that we're working on now. Doesn't he look like him? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with the makeup and everything, it's exactly like him. And, it, and, it, and that just kind of blew up. All, all of a sudden, the next thing I know, Matt's in full makeup and costume at Malibu Lake, where Karloff threw Maria into the pond, and out comes Sarah Karloff. Um, and the next thing I you know, we have this great photo shoot, and I thought, oh, there's a series here. Um, and RBFX had a Wolfman piece. So it was time to do the Wolfman, and I just kind of cold emailed Ron. That's great. Um, thankfully, I had the pictures of what we had done. That was kind of like what we wanted to do, and Ron showed up. Um, and then the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, and I love that David just said that, because I, I want to reiterate that about all of the monster families that we have. They do show up. Like, when, when I was creating the Monster Kids uh, panel for last year, I thought, how in the hell, like, they're gonna really want to come to Midsummer and sit on stage and, and talk about, you know, their growing up. Every one of them was all in, like, like instantly. And the most approachable, nicest people in the world. And they all get it. They're out there on Celebrity Row or whatever we want to call it at the convention floor, right? But you know what? They all have said to me separately, not together, not on stage in front of people and cameras, they've all said it's not about us, it's about our family, and, and it's about us preserving the legacy. So they get it. So when you guys do talk to these folks, they are so 100%. They do show up. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, especially in this case. All right, so who wants to see a little bit of Devil's Den? It's not a lot. This is, this is and, a little who wants, short. and who wants to see all of Devil's Den? <laughs> This is put together as a presentation piece. There's there's a feature behind this. Um, All right. So we did this to kind of garner attention, kind of show this is our first. Pro I mean, this is a first for both of us. Um, so we've never done anything like this before. Let, let alone rolling onto the Universal backlot with Ron Cheney to go to the costume department. So what? That's, that's so great. Um, that's so, a pinch yourself moment, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, ultimately at the end of this, I'd love to get a, some sort of reaction as to whether or not this is something people would watch a feature version of. Alright, well let's find out. Let's, let's go ahead and roll Devil's Den.
buddy. We take off now, in town, before dark, collect our bounty, be home in no time. I shot you dead. Six weeks ago. They don't function like us. They don't bleed like us. See? You want to kill them? You got to shoot them in the head.
the audience if you worked on the film. Raise your hand. There we go. Yeah. All right. So he went in and he wrote all kinds of new stuff and put it together in the band and Joe, they wrote the music for it. And I'm like, this is pretty kick ass, man. Let's, let's do it. So we went in and, and produced it. And there we go. There we go. So yeah, um, it's uh, like I, I've always said uh, when people ask me, like I'm a, an Iowa boy, you know, and everything. I moved out here. People talk about LA and stuff, and I always say that uh, you know Los Angeles is a big city, but uh, like Hollywood and the music industry and stuff, it's a very small community, uh, and it's it's very relationship driven. And so uh, I met David a couple of years ago at a project at Warner Brothers, and then uh, through that um, ended up meeting Ron, and then what a joy, you know, to uh, have the opportunity to to uh, take two things that are I'm so passionate about with. Uh, my acting and then now the music and to be able to partner with these guys uh, and then being here today is just like a dream, you know. Uh, and thank you, Rick, as well, for, for putting this together. And so, um, yeah, so the band and I, uh, we ended up, uh, had this opportunity, I took the band, like, hey guys, um, you probably might, might not believe this, but I think we might have an opportunity to, to work with uh, Ron Chaney, you know, Lon Chaney Jr., Lon Chaney. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I did this little movie and then that ended up leading in. I mean, what happened was Ron met me after I took Zombie Pete's uh, makeup off, which was done by Andy Schoenberger, award-winning uh, makeup artist, worked with Johnny Depp and did the Penguin and uh, all that in uh, Batman Returns. Anyway, so I took the mask off and I looked like this. So he said, of course, the guy's got to be a metal, a metal guy. But anyhow, so... Uh, it's funny because you meet certain people and it's just like you automatically feel a kindredship to them. Uh, it's, you know, whether it's a soul thing or whatever, but that's, I just, like immediately met Ron with no preconceived notions about what may, may come of our relationship. Uh, but then Ron gave me this poem that he had written um, based off a dream that he had had about the, the film. And so uh, then I started taking it and, uh, and, and molding it into what became Devil's Den. 
and uh, working with the guys, uh, which you will introduce here in a moment. But uh, if anyone's interested, uh, I, asked, I, asked, I asked permission from, from Rick to see if this was okay, but uh, if you guys are interested in anything more about the band, uh, one, you can go to deepwithinband.com, and we're also on social media. We're getting ready to hit our first U.S. tour. Yeah! We're leaving in August. We're going around the country with a couple national bands, Edema, Smile, Empty Soul, and then our uh, debut album will be out. Uh, we actually just signed, it's not even released yet, but we signed with a, a, a label uh, near Paris, uh, so it's a French label. Uh, so we'll have international and national distribution on the album, uh, self-titled. So that, that'll be coming out probably later this year or the first part of next year. So everything's very exciting, and uh, Ron and I are actually maybe even kicking around another potential project uh, for, for a song with something that he's... Uh, would you guys like that? Yeah. <laughs> of course. I mean, there's a lot more Ron Chaney. So, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, very privileged to work on it. And then Ron came to the studio uh, the day that I did my vocals, and he was there and, and just really fell in love with the song. And uh, I think there may be an opportunity for us to hear it at some we, point. Yeah, we actually uh, dropped it. Out, guys. We dropped it into the uh, credit sequence. We chopped it yeah, up a little bit. Yeah, there was some of it um, in the credit sequence. Recording, and I, we're talking at some point about doing a music video. And we're, but we I are think all of that call. with pales in comparison to hearing this thing live. Yes, oh. yes. At some point in time, uh, we, we'd love to, to have you guys. We will be performing the song live at some point in time, but logistically, okay, it was just a little tough, you know, to, to work everything in. And this panel is about Ron and his legacy and the family and everything. This isn't about the family. So uh, I, it's just a privilege to be up here. But um, I do believe we may have a full recording of the song. Wow, well, that's a surprise. Is that, that's do we, great. Do we? Uh, is, would you guys like to hear, you guys want to hear the, the full song? song? Wow. wow. You're sitting here and you're patient. Uh, I might know a guy. Let me get. <laughs> I think. Yes, Rick, yes, Rick, we can. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's have the band come up. Guys, come on, come on, come on, come on, keep it in. Don't, don't bother going around the prison. Yeah, just if you guys are, you know, come on, you're used to there jumping on and off stages. There we go. I can, I am capable of doing that. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was yeah. told not to. So, so yeah. real, I'll just introduce the guys real quick. So this is jo Joe composed uh, the song. He composed both of the yeah. music, uh, and we all worked together as a band. But uh, so Joe uh, uh, is one of our guitar players, and then uh, Cody here is the newest member of the band. He's, he's fresh, and he's the drummer. So he's excited uh, as well about being a part of the band and also going on tour. And then Jason uh, is uh, kind of my my uh, right hand when it comes to uh, you know making sure that things get done with the band. Jason plays bass, and so uh, pretty soon we're going to be hitting the road. Our first show is in Denver, uh, August 24th, and then we're going to be playing in you know Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. If you know anybody in these states, Tennessee, Kentucky. But uh, anyway, we got uh, more to go, and uh, let's go ahead and uh, if we can, uh, Rick, maybe we'll listen to that song. We got time. Yeah, let's turn it up. Let's and crank it. Play some rock and roll. Let's go. Get it up. Come on, you guys, get in here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams, 
the song. So growing up in the 80s, I, I had Dream Warriors with Nightmare on Elm Street 3, right? And it totally like, the first time I heard the song, it, it had that vibe. I was like, this is like Dream Warriors, but now in modern era and more like kick you in the nuts version of it. But I mean, and I think it was really great. You guys really like that? Thank you so much. Really, really cool. I love that, that Ron is producing that kind of, like, come on, man. That's crazy. That's so much fun. I want to thank all of our guests for being here. And, you know, I want to thank all of you for spending some time here at Midsummer with us. And ladies and gentlemen, from the Paris Opera House to Devil's Den, <laughs> Cheney. Thank you guys. Let's get a shot. We get a photo. Yeah, of course. Uh,